Today on the Perception in Action podcast, a look at some technologies that might allow for a coach or therapist to guide motor learning remotely. What has initial research shown on the effectiveness of these devices? How should auditory and vibrotactile feedback be used to guide movement? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In the not-too-distant future, you'll be able to walk into a Nike Town store, buy a Tiger Woods branded golf shirt, and when lining up your shot on the fairway, hear Tiger Woods' voice gently suggesting a change in technique, say a longer pause at the top of a long iron shot. That was a quote from an article published earlier this year by Sport Techie. It reflects a growing interest in wearable technologies to guide motor learning. These technologies combine some sort of motion tracking or position sensing with concurrent feedback, that is feedback during the action, that can be used to guide or correct a movement. Feedback is usually auditory or vibrotactile. I think these technologies are also particularly relevant right now because they allow for the potential of remote coaching and physical therapy. So in today's episode, I want to look at them in more detail. What has initial research shown about their effectiveness? How should the signals be used to support skill acquisition? As part of this, I'm also going to share with you a portion of the video journal club I did recently looking at a specific example of this type of technology the Kinesthetic Awareness Training System, or CATS, by PantherTech. As I mentioned, the idea of this technology is to combine some type of sensors with feedback in a wearable system for an athlete. The basic logic is that a major component of coaching and therapy is the real-time feedback provided to the performer in the form of visual demonstrations, verbal cues, or tactile feedback when repositioning the body. Such feedback is of limited availability, of course, due to the time and costs associated with working directly with a coach or therapist. This is obviously an issue that has become even more exacerbated recently with social distancing measures. Using a remote system allows a performer to get concurrent knowledge of performance feedback readily and easily. As I will describe in a few minutes, systems have been developed that are designed to be fully automatic and self-directed, In other words, some sort of algorithm or AI is used to analyze the sensor data and provide feedback, or coach-led. For example, as you will hear about the CAT system, the coach uses a video feed to mark the target body positions and select the type of feedback to be used for the individual athlete. An example of this technology can be seen in the prototype interactive shirt described by Kim and Kim in a paper published in 2019. This technology uses a flex sensor sewn into the shirt. This sensor is a type of resistor whose resistance varies depending on its shape. So for example, it can be used to detect the angle of a body part as you bend your arm or leg. It is combined with a small tactor that can be used to deliver a vibration to the body based on the flex sensor signal, and a handheld switch which allows the user to register reference postures. So for example, if I was doing an exercise where I didn't want my arm to extend beyond 90 degrees, I could move my arm to that position, press the handheld switch, Then I would receive a vibration on my arm whenever I moved it beyond this 90 degrees target angle. Another example is the Athos training clothing, which includes EMG sensors and gives the user a target and feedback based on muscle activity. If you're a good, dutiful listener to the podcast, bells should be ringing in your head right now about how to apply good motor learning principles to this technology. How frequently should the feedback be given? Should it be used to prescribe an ideal movement form? If so, should it pull the user to the correct form by having the feedback only active when they're in the correct range? Or should it push them away from the incorrect technique by giving the feedback only when they're out of range? Or should we be using it completely differently to encourage exploration and self-organization of movement solutions? How should we avoid the athlete becoming dependent on these signals? From my perspective, these are issues that have not been given nearly enough attention in the design of these devices where the bulk of the focus has been on the tech itself. This is a large reason why initial efforts have shown relatively poor results. In a systematic review published in 2017, Van Breda and colleagues looked at studies that investigated the effectiveness of concurrent vibrotactile feedback for motor learning. A total of nine studies were identified. Two of these studies looked at rowing, two at snowboarding, one at treadmill running, 
two at simple single degree of freedom arm movements, and one teaching drawing. A major limitation of these studies is that most were kind of self-fulfilling prophecies. That is, they were designed to teach an ideal form and then they measured form, rather than any aspect of the performance outcome we really care about. For example, in 2012, Spell Mazan used sensors mounted on a snowboard to instruct the user to shift their weight more to the front foot, a vibration on the thigh, or to lean more into a turn, a vibration on the left or right shoulder. The main dependent measure were blind ratings made by a snowboard instructor before and after training with the device. The results were kind of a mixed bag with some users showing improved form and some not. It also seemed to depend on whether they received traditional verbal instructions before using the device itself. Similar results were shown in the studies of rowing where there were no clear training benefits found. From their review, the authors concluded, quote, vibrotactile feedback lacks scientific support for the enhancement of sports performance outcomes, end quote. And, quote, the inconsistency of findings and moderate level of support, as reported in the present study, hardly provide evidence to support the suspected role, end quote. As you will hear in the clip that follows, I discuss how we might better design these technologies based on good principles of motor learning with some of the developers and users of a specific system, the CATS. Hope you enjoy. What we're going to be talking about today is uh, this uh, technology that Joe, is, I'll introduce in a second, is developing for doing um, the uh, it's kinesthetic awareness training system, right? So, um, so for doing you know among other things uh, in in this time right now, for doing remote training is really uh, possible for motor learning and, and training. So, before we get into the details of it, I thought I would just go around the room and let everyone introduce themselves. So, um, Joe, I'll let you kick it off first. Uh, thanks. I'm uh, Joe Shattuck, and uh, I'm here in Evergreen at the Panther Tech Lab. And uh, thank you, Rob, for having me on. This is great. I, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. And then top corner, Justin, who we found out is not that far from me physically. Uh, but, uh, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, my name is Justin Wick. I am the throwing technician for Denver, Colorado-based Cannon Arm Training. I work alongside Tyler Sheppel, who we'll introduce here in a minute. Um, I'm a baseball alumnus of both South Mountain Community College in Phoenix, Arizona, and Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. And I'm still throwing it a little bit myself, training and continuing to return to some, whether it be a summer league or some independent action and making the most out of what I'm able to learn as teaching guys throughout all kinds of facets of baseball in Denver right now. Awesome. And last but not least, Tyler in my bottom corner for me. Yeah, my name is Tyler Shuppel. Um Currently in uh, Centennial, Colorado, where we do our training, uh, we've got a program called Cannon Arm Training. Uh, work with about uh, 100 to 120 athletes a year, um, but we really focus down on on probably about 40. Uh, I played at uh, University of Washington and then professionally with the uh, Milwaukee Resort. So I've uh, been coaching ever since I got done playing. Um, that's been, uh, I guess, about 18 years now that awesome. I think about it. But mm -hmm. uh, and, and always kind of coached while I was playing, so always had a, had a desire to work with the youth and, and really help uh, athletes as they develop. Awesome. So, yeah. So as I mentioned, what we're going to do today, we're going to um, discuss a little bit, and then we're going to show, I'm going to show show a video of the product, uh, maybe a little live demo of, of some of it. Um, um, that technology, and then should mention. This is a beta. This is a very early stages of the product, right? It's still being developed. And um, right. Joe, as you say, Joe, she, we're really interested in a lot of feed, uh, feedback at this point and ideas for what yeah, people want, want out of this kind of. So so if anyone watching along, as usual, if you're watching along on YouTube or Facebook, if you post questions or anything in the comment section now, uh, I can bring them in and we can ask people here. Or if, we, if you're watching this later on, you can always po post them and we can, we can respond in an email or something like that. Okay, so to kick it off, Joe, I thought I would ask you, you know, just a little bit, you know, about your background and kind of the genesis of this technology, where it came from and, and how you got started. Sure. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me say thanks again. Uh, I went to school in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I would always listen to your podcast along that lonely <laughs> I-76, and it's nine hours and 15 minutes and every two weeks. So I think I got through almost all of them. You have years up there. It's great. <laughs> anyway, so I'm thrilled to be on, but... Um, the story is, is really not about me, it's about the cat, but I think it might help to, to 
um, like you said, give the genesis of it. Mm-hmm. And it comes in, in three legs, a three-legged stool, if you will. One is my, my career as a player, my career as a coach, and then my education. So I was a racquetball player for 20-something years. Um, I played professionally 12 years straight. I uh, was in the top 10 for uh, 10 years and peaked at number six for like two weeks. That was the, that was the peak. And uh, some world championships, played all over the world. It was great. Um, but when I uh, started, uh, I started late. I started at 17. So I didn't have the mature strokes. I didn't have the coaching. I didn't come up through the juniors. So I had to become sort of a, a very quickly um, learn a, the, the technical side of the game, the strokes, biomechanical strokes. Um, so that was part of it. Uh, and then racquetball is not big money, so you always had to do something else. I was one of the lucky ones that also got to coach um, and, and make a living out of racquetball coaching and, and running programs. I was the pro at the Denver Athletic Club for seven years, had a company called Racquetball Academy. In any case, I'd spend hours and hours and hours in a court with another athlete trying to get them to move in a certain way. Um, and essentially... Uh, What we do as movement educators, if you're an athlete or a physical therapist or a coach, is we use words and metaphors and uh, visual uh, cues and and video even to try to make an athlete move the way you want them to move, experience that sensation of movement, and then recreate it, you know, a thousand times later, right? Um, And it occurred to me in teaching that I wish there was a way I could sort of capture and impart and we all use the freeze technique okay freeze and then look at your arm or look at your whatever but looking is not a a substitute for feeling the way your body feels with your proprioceptive mechanoreceptors right Mm -hmm. so that was kind of where the seed was planted is you know hours and hours and hours people would fly to denver and we do um you know two days for six days then they'd go home then they'd come back in two months and i'm like what happened right that kind of thing (laughs) so that's kind of where the need Mm -hmm. i saw the need for this Mm -hmm. Also, just like any other sports, like baseball or any any ball control sports, you know, there's a hundred different strokes, right? There's I don't know how many different pitches, but in racquetball, there's short strokes and open stance and overheads and spins and lobs and all kinds of things that you do from different parts of the court. Um, and so, in that case, like I said, I need to become a technician. Mm-hmm. Um, then near the end of my career, I uh, I realized I I want to stay involved in this and do something else. So I got a master's in sports science. And was influenced highly by Anders Ericsson and deliberate practice, solitary practice. Um, uh, um, Nick Sturgio is on my, my PhD committee with movement variability. Mm-hmm. So movement adaptation strategies. So it all sort of converged into train to adapt, not to perfect, which is a little article on the website. Mm-hmm. Um, in any case, it occurs to me that the, the main thing you're, you're, you are working with an athlete is what are you doing now? And what do I want you to do different? And so the athlete needs to say, what am I doing now? And what does my coach want me to do? And it turns out to be essentially, um, let's call it, the system is supposed to, is designed to take trial, error, and I wonder if I'm doing this right, Mm -hmm. later down the road to trial, error, awareness of the error, and then the subsequent correction. And anybody in motor skill learning, there's the improvement doesn't happen in the doing it right. It happens in the adjustment to the exploration of the motor space, mm-hmm. which is uh, what I, I just, I know I'm a nerd, but I just light up <laughs> when I see an athlete um, figure that out in their body. Um, and oftentimes you have to, because the visual system is so dominant, you have to block that out to redirect the focus onto uh onto the body. So for example, Justin, when we were training you, you would look at the body part we were working on. I'm like, Justin, don't look. Let your, your body is beautifully equipped with all kind of proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors and stretch receptors. That will tell you. You can't be looking at your arm during your pitch, right? Mm. So a combination of all these things um, mm. kind of led to the convergence of what is now essentially the cat. Um, one more thing I'll mention is that uh, there, there's really two two things here. One is teaching of a specific skill, which I know, Rob, there's, Mm -hmm. there's different uh, theories about how to acquire a certain bandwidth of skills, right? Mm -hmm. The best way. Mm -hmm. And then there's kinesthetic awareness, which is what the device is called. Mm -hmm. So I always use this example of if you've ever tripped up a curb, that's an example of a flawed model. Now your brain moves your body around in the world based on this model that it makes, right? If you trip up a curb, either the model of where the curb was in the world was too low, you thought it was, you thought it was high, mm-hmm. 
or vice versa, or the model of where your foot was in relation to yourself and everything else in the world was, was incorrect. But when you trip, you immediately recalibrate like, oh, now I know where everything is. Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea besides some of this immediate feedback is that, um, poof, immediately recalibrate, oh, that's what you want me to do. And mm -hmm. oh, that's where I was. And now when the two merge, then you get the, the learning. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a long way around the three or four legs that kind of made the cat come to what it is. Okay. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I, I kind of like both as a feedback tool, you know, mm -hmm. when you're actually trying to do a certain movement and mm -hmm. kind of a, so I might use like a guidance, like to get you to feel, how, guide you through a movement to help you feel, you know, I, and I know I agree that the feel part is a, is a big important. <laughs> when I was an athlete, I, I, I think they, I'm sure as a coaches, you guys see the same thing, right? There's huge variability in how aware people are of their bodies and the feel. <laughs> Some people can't get it at all. And, exactly. And right? So I, I can totally see the, the benefit of that aspect. Mm -hmm. So to get into it a bit. So the, the player, like Justin, when you're using it, you're wearing a, is it, it's a motion tracking, right? Uh, is it accelerometer? It like, yeah. It looks like this, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Um, this is the prettier version, yeah, but Justin's it's got, got accelerometer, yeah. magnetometer. You can yeah. use a strap with it if you want, but yeah. Okay. And you're wearing that. You can wear that on any, any of your body parts. So it's tracking your motion and X, X, Y, Z. Um, and then mm -hmm. it's sending that signal to uh, the app. On a phone, on a phone, Tyler. You mentioned uh, like the slow mo, like the difference between. So the, one of the big advantages of this, right, it allows people to do full speed and get kind of field feedback. You mentioned that kind of slow motion is kind of limited in terms of the, you know, how people can pick pick up the things you want. Is that is that kind of the yeah point? yeah yeah? So for our athletes, um, you know, we we break down quite a bit. There's there's a lot of. Uh, programs that'll just let's see if we can recruit and use our muscles and, and try to throw hard right and mm -hmm. they just let their guys go and it's kind of figure out how you can get better right well i feel like there's there's better techniques along that so we break down mechanically um more probably than a, and a lot of places do and that's why we find a lot of use in this device is that our guys are already used to breaking into certain spots so um one of the things we'll do is we'll have a guy break into a certain spot and then go into slow motion after that, kind of follow the path of where he thinks he's going to go once he gets to handbrake. So we'll get guys to handbrake. Then we'll be like, okay, I just want you to kind of go roll and kind of get into rotation from there. Guys just can't do it. It's, mm -hmm. you know, they feel like they've never even moved their, their glove before, right? So um, you'll see them start like going in weird directions and pulling up. So what this allows them to do is actually – I can set it to that angle. So when our guys start to rotate into angle, we want to keep that angle. Mm -hmm. So I can either set it to where it's vibrating constantly, letting them know that, hey, I'm in a good spot, or we can set it to where if they get out of that spot, then it starts to beat. So they know that they're not in the angle that we want them to be in. So um, it gives them gives them feedback on both ends there. But um, yeah, for us, it's, it's I want you to get to this spot, and I want you to get to this spot, and then we eventually start to add it on and let it kind of flow together. Yeah, so you have kind of like key points you want them to hit during the delivery and kind of connect them. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And just, and, yeah. And, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and that changes for every guy, yeah. right? So um, being able to reset the angle, use the device, um, that's where the coach comes into play. So it's, it's not replacing coaches. Mm -hmm. It's the coach can then set it for them to use and, and especially remotely where Justin uh, went down to Arizona for the kind of time being right now, we were able to still, Hey, I need you to get to this spot. He, he sends me a message. I get on, we can look at it, we can set it and then he can go along his training. So I don't have to be with them the entire, entire session while he does it, if that's what we want to do also. So, yeah. And Justin, there was something interesting you said, I think, um, you know, you were mentioning when you get fatigued or something, I think mm -hmm. uh, as a pitcher, I'm sure it's very common, like you start missing your locations and you can't figure out why, you know, what am, am my release point dropping? What am I, you know, so I think this could help, right? Let you know, you're still hitting, you're still, you know, yes. what's going on. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, in particular, I mean, as a, as a pitcher and when you're throwing on back to back days in some instances, or as a starting pitcher, if you're working in the fifth, sixth, seventh inning of a particular outing, 
certainly your body's going to start breaking down. And something that I really like what Joe has said numerous times, you know, the visual system is truly so dominant. And when you're trying to look at, I mean, even in a training setting, here it is, I would put, and it's a very non-invasive device. I put this thing on, let's just say, whether it be my arm right here, or I'll put it on my back leg or on my knee to feel what I need to do with my load of my pitching delivery. I've noticed I'll get to the end of a session and I like to put it, I mean, let's say I start early on my early throws off the mound or something, then I'll take a break. I mean, as a reliever, I try to simulate the one inning at a time type of settings, but it's amazing to see what can change from one throwing session to the next, even within the same day, if it's the same session, something early on versus something later. I like to put this on before and after just to make sure I can confirm where I am. And particularly if I can confirm something other than my visual system, mm -hmm. I'll take video on my phone like none other. And I'll make iMovie super cuts on every <laughs> intricate thing. And I'm going, you know, I can either sit here and analyze this video saying, was this arm exactly where I wanted to? And then I'm setting up multiple camera angles and I'm going like I'm seeking confirmation for something so minuscule. Whereas I'll put this on my arm. I just instantly get auditory feedback saying this is exactly the position that I want it to be in. I found that not only does it save me a lot of time as I'm trying to frantically decide, you know, is it just a kid deceptive camera angle that this was? Well, no, I've got something that knows exactly the position that I want to be in. And as I get tired over the course of a day, I've got something that confirms instantly that I'm doing what I want to be doing. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. I think that's a, that's a good point, and I, I can imagine that's really tricky as a pitcher. <laughs> There's so, it's yeah, such, a, such an, a complex movement. When it goes wrong, to figure out why is, is, is really <laughs> tricky. Yeah. When I worked in Nebraska Athletic Performance Lab in Nebraska, we'd have these weekly meetings that was all about um, uh, what the coaches want. And we had you know, more data than – we had tens and thousands of data points with our you know, motion capture and force plates and all that. But the coaches just wanted an actionable item. So if they said, I want to know the, the rotation of the shoulders during the delivery or, you know, that angle, you could give them, you know, 3,000 data points from a session or two weeks practice. But the deal is, what do they do with that data? So, so it's not what, what the device can do, it's what do the coaches need. So if I need to know, Justin, if you're overshooting your target or undershooting your target, that would be the benefit of the data. Not that I have seven weeks worth of, you know, triplanal acceleration data. <laughs> As a coach, I want to say, you're doing this. I want you to do this. Let's see how it works. Or you're not doing this, and I want you to try this. And and honest movement adaptation strategy, you're a different athlete in the first inning as you are in the eighth. So, you're, again, you're training to, to perfect your craft within a certain bandwidth rather than this is, has to be this exact angle all the time. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just to kind of so the capture. So the way that you guys are using it, maybe do you? So you initially kind of either do you position Justin kind of in the the where you want him, and then capture that angle because obviously you don't know the angle and degrees off off the top of your head, right? Because I want him at seventy two degrees, right? So you, you kind of physically then, and or do you do you, can you capture it like dynamically? Like so, if he did a real pitching delivery or oh, you it's in the works. You're okay ideally yes with, okay. A, with a higher sampling rate and mm -hmm. you know that kind of thing for right now it's more for your basic skill progression you know a start a finish something in the middle to teach the the movement but i'll let justin speak on because he's the one who used it for you know pitching exactly. yeah and she sent me one in the mail and i'm taking full advantage using it as much <laughs> as i can <laughs> no. so you no, i mean it's typically let's say if i'm doing something with just mm -hmm. my front side activation i'll just tape this onto my arm or use a strap whatever i can to secure it onto the surface of the skin mm -hmm. and then let's say i want to get into position feel my scap pinch being able to get into adequate rotation effectively like i want to i will feel this out and then i'll go onto the app itself onto this phone and I'll just hit a series of buttons and I'll make sure I lock this and then it'll record the exact position for it. Sure. And then mm -hmm. I can select whether or not I want this. It, it vibrates and it can make a sound. Okay. So I typically turn both on just because I'm <laughs> hanging out at the park and why not, you know. But it's, I'll typically say, I mean, in a lot of the actions, primarily what I've done, I'll set it to where when I get into this particular range, I want it to beep and I want it to vibrate. So I'll just instantly hit it and... I mean, I've gotten pretty good at just this beta testing version of the app that we have right now, and I can set it pretty confidently within about 15 seconds. I've got a pretty good idea of not only the exact spot that I want it to be in for it to give me this feedback, 
but also the range that I want it to be in. I can select how precise and how limited I really want it to be. And I would say that within, I mean, within a matter of seconds, I'm able to exactly pinpoint where I want it to be. That, of course, assuming I know where I want it to be, which there's a whole method of coaching into that and that kind of thing. But it gives me instant details. And it's, I had, I played in a bunch of summer leagues over the past couple of years. I played in St. Cloud, Minnesota over the last two summers. There's a teammate of mine that he went to Wake Forest and I wanted to talk to him a lot about, you know, what do you guys have? They've got a whole pitching lab at Wake Forest, which I'm just enamored by, but he's talking about, they have like marker motion capture, different, like a a whole laboratory that people have. And I wasn't, I hadn't met Joe at this point in time, but I'm hearing all these stories that what Wake Forest is able to do, putting sensors all up and down the body, which I mean, unbelievable stuff, but being able to see something like this in the simplest form of, I mean, instantly, this is what I really want to focus on. And this is how I'm going to be able to make it work. It's unbelievable to see how, you know, this is just one marker, but being able to know where to pinpoint it and where to put this down, I think that it definitely can get people kickstarted and it's a lot more functional rather than, I mean, I go to a park and I'm able to have my own motion capture lab. Essentially. I realize it's not necessarily mm-hmm. to the extent of what they have, but it's unbelievable. It's so to close. Though. It's so close. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess from the coaching side, Tyler, you would, so you could guide them through this kind of capture process, say, you know, here's where I want you to be on this part. Right. So capture this angle. I like the way that looks. Is that kind of what you do? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's yeah. exactly how we yeah. do it. So um, Justin's unique, but you know he's yeah, worked at this yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really yeah. Hard. yeah. So, um, but for normal athletes, um, or when we started, right, uh, he came in. We'd have him get into position. And we'd set that angle, and we were laughing, and it happened in the video on the uh, on what he sets it precise wise. Like I know him; he's not giving himself a lot of room. And so when, in the video, we were at a point seven variation which is i mean you've got to hit it almost exact and he's hitting it every time um but yeah so we'll set uh we'll set the angle and and like he was talking about we've got one that uh we set on the back leg um which is our stable leg when we go to throw or or push off which is what some people will say i don't like that term um but uh so it's our it's our back leg that we rotate off of we can set we've got um just through our work uh kind of an idea of where we want guys to be there. Again, that's individualized on how much bend we want to have on that back leg as we start to go down the hill. So that's something we can work on. That's originally what we started with that. And now we've done some uh, front side arm stuff. We'll do some torso stuff on, on how we'll be when we rotate. So as we get into this more, we realize, holy cow, we can use this for this and we can use it for this. Now that becomes an issue because now we're going to need about 10 different units, but that's good for Joe, right? I'm working on it. Yeah. 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 And I like the, so the use of the standard deviation, Joe, I think is interesting, especially when you can capture it dynamically, Mm because I think that's a good move because it will allow you to scale it kind of for skill. Mm -hmm. So an Mm -hmm. athlete, not young pitcher, that's really variable and all over the place is going to have a larger Versus an elite one like Justin, he's, if he can consistently make the movement, the well, standard deviation is going to be smaller, right? So his range is mm-hmm. going to be. Uh, but it, so do you? But do you? Uh, when you coach, do you have different kind of bandwidths for different these points? So some of them you want a bit tighter, some of them bigger range, or just kind of use the same kind of for all of them. Do you know what I mean? So, so, so some some movements maybe you you allow a little more tolerance, and other ones you you want a little tighter. Is do you you, have, you do that? Well, I mean, I think it, yeah, it goes per athlete, like you were talking. I mean, you say like some younger athletes to some older athletes. I have some younger athletes that will nail it more than some of my older guys that are still. I mean. We get asked all the time, you know, do you work with eight year olds mechanically? And I go, maybe. Mm-hmm. Right. So we get them in if they understand what we're trying to do. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be afraid to put the cat on an eight year old. Now we might give them a little more deviation, like you said, because, you know, we want them just to feel good about the position they're starting to get to. I mean, we do that as a coach, you know, you're kind of like, okay, you're almost there. You're getting closer, right? Those are terms that we would typically use. Well, now we don't have to use those terms. We can set it and be like, okay, yep, you're getting closer. You see how it's beeping. Now we want to make it a little bit harder and they can keep pushing to that, to that advantage. So. Mm -hmm. 
And you mentioned, Joe, you can all, I think you said, you said this, uh, you can either have it as kind of a, uh, negative feedback, like when you go outside the range or mm-hmm. continuous feedback when you're inside, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's something, something to avoid mm-hmm. and then, uh, or something to seek. So the target to avoid or the target to, to seek. But w- what's interesting to me is, um, the two things of one is teaching the, what a specific skill should feel like. And then also general kinesthetic awareness. Um, and, and both of those things are obviously important in, in, uh, in any motor skill acquisition, because again, the learning happens in the error. Uh, but I'm curious as to, and I haven't talked to you about this specifically, Tyler or Wick, but, mm-hmm. but if you could put a number on how much does improve overall kinesthetic awareness for your performance as an athlete in general, not specifically related to that sport, in other words, how quickly can you recalibrate and how much of it um, is specifically toward understanding the mechanics of the stroke or the, the movement that you're trying to master. And you don't have to answer now, but it ju- that question just occurred to me that what's the, what's the proportion of those two? Ideally, I would like it designed to, to do both so that you have retention and transferability no matter how fatigued you are or no matter what the other social cycle pressures are on you during competition. Mm-hmm. Dustin, you want to go? Uh, you go ahead. I actually kind of want to hear what you got, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for just again, he's, I haven't seen him for a few weeks, but I know if he comes back, he's going to be nailing it every time. And this is something that we've struggled with for him. First of all, Jess is very unique in the way that he throws and the way that he breaks. And, uh, most coaches would look at him and be like, Oh, he can't throw like that. Like it's not going to work. Well, he's done pretty well for a long time. And, uh, you know, with the break doing, sorry, I go doing this, this isn't a typical, this isn't a typical break that we have for, there's two guys out of the, maybe the hundred. So 2% that break like Justin does. So, um, with that, and then being able to push, um, again, can we get better? Can we get even further? Right. So is there, is there options for us to get even more from it? Um, I think, I think we will, you know, so, uh, we're just, even as much as we've used it again, we, we keep finding more that we can try to do. And I think that's the exciting part from it. Yeah, no, I think that's really, really interesting. And I, other thing, maybe this is more of a question for when there's the two version 2.0. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but what, what, Justin, what, when you set an angle kind of statically, then so you say, say you set it so it's going to be always vibrating when you're in the right angle or, or make a set. What happens when you do a full speed delivery with that all? Can you do a full speed delivery yes. and use kind of the feedback, even though it's that, you know, if you, as you're going yes, through that point? And- for that reason specifically, I will generally I'll stay away from keeping it on my throwing arm itself, just because of how quick the motion is. And I mean, the same, I mean, it's I've heard the pitching motion is the arm movement is the, like it replicates almost the blink of an eye how fast the arm can move. And I mean, any frame rate of a non slow motion camera will show that to you. But I will typically, I mean, I'll I like to keep it on if I can put it on a lower half limb, if I can put it on my glove, if I can put it on a certain thing. I favor those kind of details. And I mean, the delay on something like this is actually very good. Like it's minimal and I can feel it pretty much right away. If I'm doing something at full speed on anything other than my actual pitching arm, I feel like it gives me pretty adequate feedback. And I mean, a lot of it depends on the specificity of the kind of movement that you're really trying to target. If you're trying to get in some mechanical position, it's going to vary a lot of differences, but I think, I think something, I mean, it connects with Bluetooth connection and I feel like my biggest concern before I used it was wondering how long was this delay actually going to be? Because when I'm trying to get into, I'm going to hit this position and I need to make it happen. And it's been funny actually going back and seeing video of right after I've been using the cat, sometimes I'll really be like elaborating what I need to do. And I mean, it's, it's not that that's a bad thing. I think that's kind of the fun of the whole part of it because I know I'm getting into position and then from there, it smooths out a lot of details. And it's been, I think the delay on this itself, it makes it very easy to be able to get where you need to be. And then you mix that with, I mean, just the general feel and the understanding of whatever sport that you're doing. I mean, you're going to be able to have a smooth motion because you've developed the movement patterns. And I think this just makes sure you're enhancing and increasing the likelihood that you're hitting the exact movement pattern that you want to once you're able to pair that so with. Can I, yeah. 
I see Joe Can with a, a racquetball racket yeah. in her hand. So. <laughs> I can't help it. I just get so worded out. Okay. So obviously version 1.0, the sampling rate's really low. It's like 12 to 16 hertz, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it's good for static teaching of positions. Um, and you can even do it in a, a, a very slow dynamic, right? So if I'm in racquetball, I got to uh, get in the right position because Coach Winterton might be watching. So preload the hips. You can have it one, two, three and then as you're practicing would you beep 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 now unless you get to 120 hertz or more or maybe even 60 um you're not going to get the feedback in time to correct the movement just in a sport that has a start and a finish and a closed movement there's no adjusting during you just have to you get the middle the beginning and the middle and the end right um so and that's and that's where we're, we'll set like patterns and then we'll work through it. So Joe, like even through that, you'll stop there. We can yep. stop at a second point. We'll check and then we can stop at a third point and check. Right. right. So it's still through the pattern. It's just, we have to stop currently to do that. It's really funny to watch Justin like in the corner, like doing it. Cause you can't tell he has anything on. So he'll be like doing this and you'll see him get happy. And he's like in the corner. So, I mean, just to sit back and watch people do it, it's really funny because they're getting excited over like doing this. And then he's like, okay, yeah, I got it. Like it's just, uh, it's pretty entertaining to watch on the it's outside. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And, uh, no, Coach, Coach Winterton has has one of the, one of the things. Just another shout out, Coach Winterton is is just now. I was doing my swing, and I realized I wasn't quite right, and I made this adjustment. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Middle rotation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a little bit. And then, <laughs> anyway, that's the biomechanical nerdiness that you're dealing with. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And, and yeah, as you alluded to, Joe, that start, you know, there's lots of different ways to teach people skills. The main one we've been talking about so far is trying to get people to move in a particular way you're looking mm -hmm. for, which is mm -hmm. definitely a, one approach, a very popular one. Um, I was, you know, I think we talked about this before, We, we but can you set this, for example, you know, I was ta talking the other day about a problem in, in baseball where you have fly out forearm fly out as a pitcher so you bend essentially bend your arm beyond 90 degrees in your delivery which is really dangerous <laughs> um is there so is there a way you can you use this as kind of I, this is kind of so this is kind of a two-sided guidance right i want i don't want you to go above or below this angle could you make it so it's one-sided so if if i go above 90 degrees i get a vibration or a sound but if i go below i don't care what you do right i'm gonna let yeah. you yeah not that yeah. not that that's that's okay necessarily, no, but, but just in principle. No, yeah. Yeah. Actually our back leg on our back leg thing we do this is important to it. So mm -hmm. yeah, Joe, you can talk more about that. Yeah. Oh no, go ahead. That's all you. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, do you have that angle set to where you can set the outside perimeter? I know it was something you were talking about and then have it open on the on the other end. Yeah, let me show you. Uh, let me show you. Kind of, I don't know if you let me share my screen again. Yeah, go for it. This is a this is a big screen, but okay. there's a you lot to it. it. But it, but in any case, so there's yes. our guy again. Um, and so here in this particular uh, setting, or in this particular down here, there's an equal number above and below the target that you set. So you set a target of, for example, zero degrees. You got eight degrees below, eight degrees above. Um, that's how it is now. Version 2.0 will be you can um, manage each side of the distribution by saying in the back, um, I only want you to be able to go 12 degrees, and in the front, you go up to 30, 30, whatever it might be. And again, it won't be adjusting on here. Essentially, you drag this sort of triaxial unit uh, and move it around on the picture to where it matches what you think is appropriate, and then you can adjust the dots the sliders, the margin of error, based on real movement of what your athlete might do. Now, again, this is just a, a, a static picture. There's nothing moving here, um, but it's a better way to visualize than, than you know a line and a red dot. So the, the long answer is yes, it's in the works to be able to very much control um, you know, the, the margin of error on each side. The other thing is uh, how we do it now is we sort of set the middle and then um, you know each side, the 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 tolerance applies to each side of the distribution. Okay. Yeah, so Rob, Rob, essentially, you can set it right at 180 as being your low max, and then anything up to that 90 degrees, you can be in that range and still be okay. Okay. 
So you could do, so that's kind of, I would think of that. It's like a, it's a virtual constraint. It's just, it's just hitting, Correct. it's like hitting, like putting a barrier there that you would hit. But mm -hmm. so you're saying, you know, I don't want you to do this, but anything else is fine. Not that, right. as you say, pitching is probably not the best example of that. But, um, yeah, no, no, no. yeah, yeah that. Is. but the, the other thing I think you could potentially use this for that I know in that pitch, uh, probably this isn't perfect for pitching because it's dangerous. But um, one of the methods that we find helps with a lot of things is when you find someone has an error or some movement you don't like is actually exaggerating it. So getting yeah. them to feel... So making them do it even more. Um, and right. so some, for example, in hitting, sometimes you get a batter to swing with a piece of PVC pipe. And if they have any kind of really wristy in their swing, it'll make the PVC pipe really <laughs> flexible. And so potentially you could do that with this, right? You could push people even worse. <laughs> like I said, with pitching, right. you probably wouldn't want to do that because it's really dangerous, but maybe in other kind of skills, yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. a beautiful uh, yeah. example of the kinesthetic awareness part of teaching and not one specific sport specific movement or position. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you. Ever, so I got I've got a few questions here. For, here's one. I think it's kind of related to what you were talking about when you were showing the distributions of you know what kind of information you want. So this is a question pulled in about how often do you provide this kind of feedback? And I think. Um, do you do it every trial, every session? I think this is for you, Tyler and Justin. Do you do that for a little while, then take it off for a while? You know, obviously you, you can't wear that in the game, so you need to transfer. But so, do you guys have thoughts on that? How often and how you know? Can, when I, you can I jump in first? Actually, sure. mm -hmm. okay, great. <laughs> um, I'm a big believer in big study Gabrielle Wolf and variable feedback and different feedback schedules. And I, be I believe uh, there's a certain recipe of the dose type and timing of feedback, practice, and competition. Um, and in, in the next versions of the product, um, you will be able to do variable feedback or uh, you know every fourth. Um, by the way, it also collects the data too, so you get a, a report after. But um, I'm a huge believer in... Um, Manipulating environmental variables like constraints and feedback to uh, to for each individual athlete and situation and sport and movement. Um, in this case, it's just binary; it's off or on. Um, there is another option for gradient feedback. So, if you can think of, let's just say, I want to be here and I'm close, it might go beep 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 beep, beep and it would be constant. Okay. Um, or you know, like the Marco Polo further away. So. In this case, it's very basic, just binary off or on. Um, but there's so many things you could do based on scientific principles um, of how 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 feedback should be used or not. Um, yeah. So that was my piece. I wanted to say that first before those guys yeah. cut it. Yeah. What do we? Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. Go ahead, Ted. And I think about like I think maybe he's leaning towards like how often would we use it, mm -hmm. um, and then you know, and go along those lines. We use it, so I see most of our guys two to three times a week. So we'll use it, um, and we're, we're focused on mechanical stuff during that time. So during a bullpen setting, that's kind of all they're doing. We're letting them go. But during our mechanical sessions, um, how we will use it is I'll set, I'll set for the athlete, I'll set the, uh, the visual or the audio and the, the vibrate for them, and we'll do those reps for maybe two rounds. And then on the third round, I won't set that, but I'll still watch the angle, right? So I'll, I'll have them get to the angle. I'll know that they're there. They'll know that they're there, but I'll ask them, I go, is that, is that where you're supposed to be? They'll say, yes, I can show them, and they can see that, okay, yeah, I'm in the right spot. So um, we'll give them the, the audio and, the, and the, uh, the vibration for a little bit during a session, and then we'll turn it off. I think, Justin, how often you probably use it almost every day. Yeah, I mean, when you have unlimited access to something <laughs> like this, you know, you might as well take advantage. That's, yeah. that's I mean, what I do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, it's been, it's been actually very gratifying to be able to use something like this with the frequency and then being able to see what Shep and I have been able to do in our training sessions. In my own training, and I feel like the best way I can answer this is as a player myself, I will generally try to, if there's something that I really want to adjust, like something that I really want to feel, I have a notebook that I'll write down every little adjustment that I want to make as far as if it's just I want to feel something coming out of my hand a certain way 
or if I want to feel my rotation. So I'll always go into the next day of my throwing, knowing what I kind of want to lean towards, how I can perfect my craft, what I'm trying to do. So I'll always try to find, I mean, certainly I'll depend on just personal feel initially. I mean, if there's something that I really want to feel and I've been playing long enough that I've got a, at least a general idea of what I want something to feel like coming out of my rotation or if it's coming out of my hand. And I'll always, I can generally always try to find some way that I can put this on in my throwing itself that I'm able to really enhance. Not only is my feel knowing what I'm supposed to do, but I've got something that's confirming, yes, as a matter of fact, this is working. As Joe says, you know, the visual system is so dominant. Well, the visual system is not the feel that consists with the pitcher. And I don't want to depend on that because I'll sit and I'll analyze video nonstop. But as far as, I mean, at least answer, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. answering that question, you know, frequency of how much do I use it? I would say I find a way to use it a lot and I don't want to create this to become too much of a crutch because I also want to depend on, you know, I've perfected this or at least worked to perfect this craft my entire life ever since I started pitching competitively and I've developed enough proprioception to know. But I would say more importantly, the frequency of what I use this for, you bring up the PVC pipe for a hitter, which I've seen countless stuff like that used. I'll use different resistance bands. If it's I'm feeling this, I'll put something on my hand. Shep and I will do this to feel front side activation. I'll put just a green resistance band around my waist and I'll attach it to a fence or a pole or something. And I'll work on what I want to feel my back leg doing. And I think more importantly is whenever I feel like there is an inadequacy in my own pitching delivery or something that I want to enhance to make the ball come out a little bit better, I'll feel it, I'll write it down on my notebook, and I'll think to myself, all right, let's say my back leg didn't do what I wanted it to do. I'll put on this hip lead band around my waist, and I'll set the cat somewhere on my knee or on my back leg. And I wouldn't say it's so much dependency on the frequency of how much I use it, but just particularly when I can identify one specific thing that I really want to enhance, I feel pretty confident that there's always something that I could do before my throwing. And, I mean, if you pair that with the feel of what a particular pitcher is trying to do, I feel like that creates a pretty good one-two punch if you're on the right track and doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. No, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. There, You know, there's this famous kind of body of research showing, you know, we call this a, extrinsic feedback. So it's feedback you can't perceive on your own, right? You need this. So too much of it can be bad, right? You're saying you get dependent on it. Um, so I like the idea that the coach can control it, Joe. Also, the idea, you mentioned the gradient. Along with that is if you could give the coach where they could just turn the whole volume down of it. You can. So, so yeah. after a while, so after 10 minutes, you can make it get weaker and weaker and weaker, <laughs> right? So it slowly <laughs> disappears on them in your athlete. That's interesting. Yeah, that, that's shown in other areas to be a really effective way to kind of fade it out. So – um, so they stop. Just, they don't get I'm just ripping it from them. Like yeah, I yeah. <laughs> just just stop and it's done. You're, yeah, yeah. You can't use it anymore. So yeah, I think those. That's a that's a really good point. And, um, that's beautiful. And then okay. the other. So you mentioned about the. So at the end, they get this kind of. You have both the coach and the. You did the. You showed the pie charts kind of thing. The where they could uh, see. Yeah. Um, is that meant for the coach or or the athlete as well? Well, excellent question. Yeah. Um, this, this doesn't exist in the world yet, yeah. so uh, we, we kind of don't know, but I'll pull it up again if you want to mm -hmm. show it. Um, so, I the idea that we had is it would be more of like a game, right? Mm -hmm. Like if they're doing 10 reps, we want them to get, you know, first time out, maybe we're, we're hoping for five, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then next time around, maybe we're hoping, hey, let's try to get seven closer to where we want to be, right? So mm -hmm. I think you can kind of start to push your athlete. Like when I do reps and even when I do them dry, I want to be 100% right if I can, mm -hmm. right? Now, that's not going to happen every time, but that's my goal. So it, you can start to see... Even with this, the athletes can start to be like, oh, that's cool. Like last time I, I only got five right. This time I got six or seven. And, and, and letting them understand that this is a process. Like to just get another one right might take you two weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, kind of playing it as a game too for the, for the younger guys or myself. I, I'd still compete against myself, you know, as often as I can. So. <laughs> Yeah. And I think the better thing on top of that, too, it de emphasizes. I mean, in the culture that we have in baseball, if as a pitcher, you know, you look at the radar gun, and that's what everybody kind of evaluates as the measuring stick, which I think, I mean, yes, that is true in many respects. But you'll have a kid that all of a sudden, if they're really rotating the way they need to, it de emphasizes the success is just simply the hard throwers. If there's an 11 year old kid that's just trying to throw, 
consistently and try to get into a particular position. It's no longer how hard am I throwing just recklessly, just run and gun. I need to fire this and throw any mechanical detail out the window. It really prioritizes that you're getting into an adequate position. And I guess something that I really like about a device like this is it, instead of the mindless run and gun, take a bunch of pre-workout and just throw the hell out of it. All of a sudden you're actually curating. This is a specific way that you can succeed in a little bit more applicable manner than just recklessly trying to throw. Yeah, I think it's, you know, and in, in I'm sure you remember this, Joe, from, you know, and sometimes in feedback, we distinguish knowledge of results. You know? Yeah, so results versus what, process. Pro, right, yeah, right. performance or process. Right, and, right. Yeah, so this is process, right? In, so it's not just a radar gun telling you how hard you're throwing. It's telling exactly. you process. So, yeah, yeah. Um, did you want to? The other interesting thing, I, I, so it's different because this mostly applies to knowledge of results, but what, an interesting area of research, too, has also shown that when you let the performer themselves decide when they get feedback, so self, we call it self-control, yes. uh-huh. so it, they learn uh-huh. faster. And really okay. interestingly, people in that, people actually want feedback when they do it right. When they do it really wrong, <laughs> they know. They don't want you to, t- they don't need you to tell them. So they no don't kidding. really choose. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, uh, yeah. it's a, very, so this is a bit different because it's, it's not just after the fact feedback. Like it's online. Right, right, so I don't right. know if that would apply, but um, right. Yeah. Um, well, if you, if you let me share my screen sure. one more time, mm-hmm. um, I think I'll do that. Let's see. And it's, uh, did it work? Yeah. So there you see, uh, Along those lines, I don't know if you can see this on the right. So in the, in the next version of two, when you go off and practice, for example, if you say, well, you know, you get a new kid, not Justin, who kind of knows the system already, but, you know, this is what I want you to do. Any of the green stuff here, if you can see, um, the green text is what can be manipulated by the coach to say, go do two sets of 20. You got five seconds lead time after you sort of start the session. Um, you're going to get beeps every 10 seconds to tell you what to do, you know, um, and then you have two seconds to do the movement, and it's all it's all adjustable. But the idea is that it puts markers in the data stream, so that at the end of the the session, you actually will get um, you know results like this based on those data markers in the stream. And then along here, you can also uh, well, I don't, you went to put do you, you want to put something up? We don't have it on the. Oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. No Did problem. I not do that? No, sorry, I forgot to say. Don't see it. Oh, well, that, that could be a problem. <laughs> All right, let me, uh, share. There we go. That's probably it. Okay. Let's see. There we go. This one. Okay. All right. So cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this one is the one I was saying. This one. Shoot. That's the main screen. Oh. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Uh, is that better? Yes. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. Yeah. I'm kind of a newbie here. Yeah, it's true. Um, in fact, it's still, there it is. So this screen here, any of the green text that you see, that's manipulable by the coach. So you can set your practice session and it, it beeps. So every 10 seconds, you're going to start a throw, Justin, and it'll record you know different snippets of kinematic data so that... Um, and you can adjust the feedback here too. So that afterwards, that's what allows you to get a screen like this. Cause there's no way to, uh, you have to tell, it's a dumb, it's a dumb system. You have to tell it when to start recording, when to stop recording, when, and it tells you when to get the feedback. So one of the screens important this way would be to have what you said is I want fading feedback, you know, pick some, pick some times during the middle of the session where it just starts to fade. And at the end it, doesn't have any feedback at all. It's still, it's still, uh, you know, maybe lighter and less volume, less volume, less volume. So that that's in the works. But now you just gave me that idea, so I'm going to add that in there. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> the other, um, you know, this is a way down the road, I guess. But the other thing I, I wonder if you ever thought about is having more than one sensor. Actually, uh, yeah, we have. Uh, yeah. We've we've done it. Um, not very well, mind you, because again, it's a duct tape prototype. But for hitting, for example, you might put one here, and then I don't know how much time we have, but one here on oh, this yeah, shoulder, one here on this shoulder, and so you get the timing of even a, a racquetball swing or a basketball swing. Now this won't, it shouldn't give you feedback during the swing because it's just too quick, right? Yeah. But you can swing, and it would tell you what's the delay between the shoulder opening and then the or the hip opening and then shoulder opening and. That yeah. type of feedback. That's yeah. exactly what I was thinking. Of. Coordination. Oh, like I'm sure, because as coaches, you got you right. You want not just this 
going to happen. You want it to happen relative to the timing of this other thing, right? Yeah. So I think you could really start to measure that that stuff. So yeah, uh, do we have time for one more thing? Yeah, yeah, we can go for a couple more. It's definitely. the other, uh, the other thing that you saw in the video was single plane. You did single plane mm-hmm. um, in racquetball with uh, Erica Mania. Again, she has it on her sternum. And so we were doing both. We were doing uh, a common mistake is to lean over at the waist in racquetball, especially when you get tired. So the metaphor that I use, pretend you're Superman, keep your chest out, mm-hmm. and that'll help you keep your shoulders over your hips. Um, and which is fine. You start, but then when you get tired, you also lean over at the waist. So we enabled two planes, this rotation and this rotation. And so the feedback won't occur unless both are correct. So that's one way to sort of okay. teach a more complex movement with different planes. So each of those different planes can be individually upweighted or downweighted in their tolerance. So if I care more about this than I do about this, which is probably more likely for a game because you need to be able to adjust as soon as you're first set, you can't run to a ball anymore. You are just doing this. So this would be maybe a little less to- more tolerance and this less tolerance. So with this, with the slow sampling rate, it's hard to um, do anything real life or real speed. But the idea is, theoretically, you could do multiple sensors, multiple planes, but you don't want to bombard the person with you know, feedback buzzing all different parts of the body. So, again, it's very much a tool for coaches to use at their discretion. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions, Joe, I just wanted to know from people. One, we talked a bit about the, the sampling rate, a uh, question about the precision of it. Again, the, rec- realize this is a beta, <laughs> like you're, you know, you're yeah. going to change the sensors as you, as you develop the, the product. But what's kind of the precision of it um, in terms of measuring the angles and things? Um, in our thing, we're within three degrees right now at that really low sampling rate. Okay. Now there, there's... In engineering, there's lots of different kinds of drift, you know, positional drift or, or magnetic drift. Um, I let my engineers handle those things. Yeah. Uh, but um, in the works is to go ahead and get it tested by one of the motion capture labs. Um, there's a guy in uh, South Carolina, Jesse Dean, mm-hmm. or even at the Nebraska Athletic Performance Lab or other mocap labs that I would like to, you know, to get some verification. Of it. Yeah. Okay, good. That's good. The other question, the other point was... Um, we haven't really talked about it, but hopefully people can see, uh, you know, how this could help with distance coaching from a distance <laughs> in situations right. like this. And um, right. I think it's, you know, so I imagine with you guys, Justin and Tyler, both you could be online with the person, right? Uh, like a, a FaceTiming or Zooming and, and doing it and or do does a kind of the report get sent back to the coach? Like if, if you went through a session, Justin, it get sent to a coach, something like that. How do you guys using it kind of remotely? Yeah, so we actually, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that, that video that we did was actually done remotely. So okay. that was me talking to Justin over the, so he's, he was in Arizona. Um, I could set the angle. Uh, so it's just, it's, it's, it's captured through a screen and then I can, I can adjust his computer. Right. So, um, and Joe, I think is working on some things on the technical side of that, but yeah, all that video was done remotely. So Justin's been in Arizona. I've been here and that's, that's how we did that video. And I was able to coach him, which was, was really cool. So but it was almost like, cause the, the one problem that I faced because we've done some other uh, video coaching and, you know, I like to kind of move guys into position. Like you're here. Okay. Like for them, for me to tell a guy, Hey, I just want you to roll a little bit. It's hard for him to understand. So I'll move him into that position. Essentially we're using the cat to move him into position there. So, um, just, I don't know if you and then Joe, if you want to clean up the technical side. <laughs> no, just that you're right. So, so right now the, uh, the athlete has the phone and then the device and they work it as usual, but they also have a laptop, which they screen share to a program like this. And then you do remote screen control. So Tyler's able to control Justin's laptop as he's, um, screencasting his lap on the phone. That's kind of a duct tape way to do it. Obviously with a, um, you know, we're looking for investors now when we get the funding, then it'll be a, a seamless integration where you can just use your phone by itself, um, you know, video and stream and uh, through a web portal and the other coach will be able to control it. We call it cat coach anywhere is the idea. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so I, we, we've gone by our hour. So I think uh, we'll wrap it up. Joe, can, I'll give you the last word. Where? 
can people find out more about this and um i, I don't know get in on the beta if when it when it's released right. uh, okay can you tell just where to contact you or find out more yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. We've actually we're looking for a lot of different sports. Um, we've done a demo with a two-time Olympian figure skater with semi-pro soccer, which uh, uh, one of the coaches who coached for Djokovic and tennis. And we're looking for um, experts and believers in biomechanics to beta test the system. And you just send me an email. Go to PantherTech.net is the website. Um, you, you can't buy it yet, uh, but we're looking for um, beta testers in return for input and expertise, essentially. Okay, that's it for today's episode. If you want to see the video from the CAT system with some demos and visuals, I've included a link in the show notes. And remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Uh